Hello, everyone, and welcome to Placing Faces, the show where we sit down with some of the most influential casting directors in all of Hollywood and across the entertainment spectrum. I am your host, Charlie Chappell, and today we are sitting down with the delightful Leah Daniels Butler. Leah is a warm, frank, and enthusiastic fan of films, TV, and the actors in them. She talks taste, keeping up with evolving technology, and how she finds the perfect real people to create Cinderella stories, taking fresh talent from first audition to well-known actors. Leah has worked on several movies with her brother, Lee Daniels, including Precious, The Paperboy, Shadow Boxer, and The Butler, and she's also the casting director behind TV shows like Star and Empire. Leah has some really great stories and a handful of movie recommendations for you to check out. I am now happy to report that I have seen Sparkle. So take out your notes, enjoy this episode, and I hope that you learn as much as I did. Thank you very much for having us in your offices today. Uh, We're just going to jump right into it. Okay. And I think it's always best to start at the beginning. So where did you come from and how did you get here? (sighs) Okay, where did I come from? I was born in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, um, and I moved to Los Angeles. Well, actually, I moved to Los Angeles twice. I moved to L.A. in, what year did I graduate high school? I graduated in 1983? Yes, 1983, dang. Um, 83, and then I moved here right after that. Because uh, I went to Santa Monica Community College, uh, that was the first time I moved here. And okay. This is before I, you know, had kids and um, wanted to, you know, figure, you're young. I was like 18 years old. California was calling. Yeah, yeah. And so my brother already lived out here, and this is before he was actually um, in the industry as well. He had a nursing agency, mm-hmm. and so I, I moved out here because I visited him prior to that, like in high school. I wanted to visit him. And, and I thought after I graduated, you know, I wanted to give it a shot. And it lasted literally for, I don't know, maybe a two semesters, if that. Okay. <laughs> just, just, yeah, I was young. Didn't fit the vibe? I didn't... just was young, you know, and yeah. I was just so far away from home. And so I was just like, I, you know, I wanted to go back. Mm. And I did. And when I went back, I went to um, Temple University. And from there had, well, while I was at school, I actually got pregnant with my first child. <laughs> and um, then from there, I stayed in Philadelphia and then moved back out to California. What prompted that second move? Now I'm probably about 25, 26 years old, I think. And it was just time for a change. Like okay. a, a being grown up. Like yeah. I just like, I didn't... I, I didn't really see an, like a, a huge future in Philadelphia and just opportunity. Sure. You know what I mean? It's a small, it's like a small New York, so it's it's not as much going on there. Um, I knew I wanted to do something different. I just didn't know what it was. Still young. 25 is, is young. Yeah. But I think some 25-year-olds now kind of know what they want to do. But for me, I just had kids. I was just, I didn't know what I wanted. I just knew I didn't want to be there. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's when I moved out. And this that was a time that I stayed. Okay. Yeah. What what <laughs> kept you here that time? What was the, um, the glue? I think this time it was, honestly, I had a conversation. Because um, by this time now, we're talking, what, almost five, six, seven years later. By that time, my brother had uh, his management company, mm-hmm. and I had a four-year-old and a six-year-old. Okay. <laughs> so I moved, Yeah. <laughs> but um, I moved out here with just my daughter. I had a son and a daughter. My son stayed with his dad, and I moved out here with my daughter. And um, I just knew at that point where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to stay here. I had a conversation with Candy Alexander, who is an actress. hmm and she said to me, you are, y-. And, and at the time, uh, he had, by that time, he had already introduced me to Jackie Brown and Kim Harden, and I was assisting them. You know, I think when I first moved out, it was just like little odd jobs, administration jobs, because, oh, I forgot to tell you when I was in Philadelphia, I, I worked, I did ABI, American Business Institute, and that's like a... Um, you get like a certificate for administration skills or whatever okay. it is that you do. So anyway, yeah. 
I did that, came here. Oh, and I was a manicurist there too. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing a lot of stuff, did, again, not really knowing what I wanted to do at 25 sure. years old. I just knew that I wanted something more. Mm-hmm. Come out here, my brother introduces me to Kim Harden, who was at the time looking for um, an assistant, a temporary assistant. And during that time when you were a casting assistant, uh, you didn't really have to know too much. It's just more about administration skills. And I mm-hmm. had plenty of that. Like, I, I could type. File I it and organize it. Yeah, yeah, you know, we didn't have, like, computers. Like, mm-hmm. everything was on a typewriter. You were the computer. Yes, I was the computer. <laughs> we didn't have, I think the next, the thing was the fax machine was just, like, a big deal. Uh-huh. And so when you got something faxed, it was like, okay, like this is how is this happening? So and and we had to type the contracts. Literally, if there was a mistake, it was like white out and uh-huh. like by hand. So it was it was a lot more work. But a tedium um, but, work. But yeah, but more administration mm-hmm. more administration. Um uh so anyway, there's that. He was like, I had to get a job. And so that's really why I kind of fell into working with them. But the conversation that I had with Candy Alexander was because at this time now I'm, you know, going from one project to the next with them because I did have really good skills, mm-hmm. um, administration skills. And they were like, oh, well, she's great at doing this. I didn't have to do anything else. And she said to me, because I was teetering on going back to Philadelphia, I think, and she said, you are young enough to have a fabulous career, a fabulous career in casting. And you are old enough to fuck it up. I don't know. Are we grown? Oh, grown we're very show? grown. Okay, okay yeah. we're grown folks. Show. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, you are grown enough to fuck it up. And I thought about that. And I was like, right now I'm like about, you know, 27. And she was right. That's some great advice. It really was yeah. because it opened my eyes. I was just like, okay, I need to stop bouncing around to mm-hmm. figure out I, I have I'm a young mother I'm responsible for um these two individuals <laughs> little people <laughs> and I'm growing up with them mm-hmm. really um because again there if you think about it there were four and six and I'm 25 26 so it's you're not <laughs> that you're not that far out of being a kid yeah, at that myself, time. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it was it was really um, you know you're just tr- again just trying to figure things out. And so when she said that to me, it really resonated. And I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and mm. this is what I'm going to take serious. And and I had that conversation with Kim Harden, and she took me under her wing, and her and Jackie Brown. I literally mentored me my young adult life and and you kind of stumbled into that mentorship yeah mentorship? it wasn't yeah they just because I was working with them yeah. they allowed for me to come into the room at um as an assistant and just kind of like be a fly on the wall and watch how they communicated with actors and I learned my taste in actors from them and from all the cast and directors I think uh as the years go on and you, you work with so many, you, you learn so many things from so many different people. With them specifically, Jackie uh, at the time was probably the top black casting director in yeah. Hollywood. Yeah, she was. I think it was her. It might have been maybe Vicki Thomas at the time because she's been around a really long time. Uh, Ruben Cannon and Robbie Reed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and Robbie and, and Jackie were kind of like, you know... The, really the ones because Victoria Thomas did um, she didn't mainly focus on you know uh, black projects you know I think she was just doing all projects and she yeah. might have even been telling them she might have been an executive I think at that point in her career I'm not 100% sure so don't quote me on that mm-hmm. but with Jackie and Kim they really just probably saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself at that age you know, just a young girl. And they were like, you know, we're going to help this young black girl. And thank God that they did because yeah. <laughs> it it prompts me to want to give back to people, you know, because they helped me. And so now it's important for me to help anybody that really wants to take this this career path seriously. Well, and I think it's yeah. it's one of those things that there's there's such a structure build 
that happens when early on in a career mm -hmm. you have a mentorship or you mm -hmm. have somebody who's especially of that caliber. Right. Because, I mean, if, in, if you're out there and you don't know who Kimberly Harden or Jackie Brown Carmen are, um, they're known for movies like Boys in the Hood, Jackie Brown, Friday, Cool Runnings, Hustle and Flow, mm -hmm. Blind Spotting here just a couple years back. They're really incredible casting oh, yeah. directors who, who put... Uh, they have launched the careers of so many. So many people. Yeah. I mean, when you think about the careers that Jackie, she's Lawrence Fishburne, mm -hmm. um, Cuba Gooding Jr., Regina King, Morris Chestnut, Chris Tucker. Mm -hmm. I mean, she lit Ice Cube. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. She has literally launched the careers of uh, Angela Bassett. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about it, she's just, her niche for finding talent and... And, and, ta and talent that stays. Yes. And, is, and the longevity of mm -hmm. it is just was just incredible. So yeah. I had two. I was working for two of the best, mm -hmm. you know. And um, and you learn again. They they allowed me to be in the room with them. They allowed me to to see how they communicate with producers. Learn how to um, to give constructive feedback to actors in a room and and, and and showed me how to to pull performances mm. out of actors, just how to communicate with actors. Um, and then I learned a lot too later on in my career, even more than that um, uh, as the time went on. But it was just really, at that time, it was such like, you know, it was like an incubation period. And so I learned, it's just what molded me, I, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think all of those times are super important for people early on. We were talking with your uh, assistant, Gregory. Gregory. Now Basically he's an assistant associate. associate. He, yeah, he was just recently Good promoted. on Gregory. That's <laughs> yes. awesome. He's yes. really wonderful. He was the one who introduced us. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking to him about he's been all over the place, too. He's, mm -hmm. he's interned or assisted or associated mm -hmm. in a lot of different places and how important that is for oh, yeah. somebody when they're first starting. You can go out and cast. You can go make short films, and you mm -hmm. can make longer films, and you can do all those things. But there's something about – there's a reason that tradesmen for forever have gone and worked under somebody mm -hmm. and learned the trade from somebody who's done that trade. Yeah. Because it there's just something that you learn by doing exactly what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, just being hands-on. Mm -hmm. Just like you – you can go to school because right now they do. Um, CSA has created a program. Um, uh, it's an assistance program mm -hmm. uh, that, if you you know, just sort of like it's a certificate based program, and basically there is a curriculum that, uh, as an assistant, it just basically teaches you everything as a casting assistant. What casting directors need you to know when it comes time. What you're expected to yeah. do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what's really, really helpful is that, you know, I was, I, I was, um, when they were like rolling out the beta vision or the beta version of the program, they had me and a few other casting directors come in and they went through the program with us step by step so we could ask questions. And as, you know, most casting directors that are, you know, in my age now, we um we all we all started in this business as an assistant, you know. So for us, it was like, what about this? What about this? What about this? So we knew all the buttons because, like, right now, even in my office, and I know I'm kind of jumping all over. Oh, the place, but, that's that's what this format's great for. <laughs> but um, there's nothing in my office that I can't do. Hmm. Nothing, and I do that, and I and I like it that way. Because as because I came up as an assistant, I know how to do it all, from the ruta to the tuta. Like <laughs> literally, <laughs> I can, you know, do the breakdown, pull the sides, set up the actors, run the session, negotiate the deals, talk to the producers. Like I, I literally, there's not one step that I don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. And it's good because I, when I, when I have an assistant, it's kind of like on the job training for them too, because I, and some of my stuff might be a little old school, you know, because this is how I did it. And I'm, yeah. you know, you want to come up to speed and with technology and EcoCast and all the things that they didn't have. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, submissions are way different and you have to get into the habit of doing that. But that's fine. I, you know what I mean? I, I'm always in when there's a new program or something coming up on EcoCast or Casted. I always want to be in the room 
No, you're not going to be able to do nothing because ain't nobody going to tell me if they leave, I can't do shit. No, I want to do it all. Uh-huh. Every bit of it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so you've continued to learn and grow. Oh, yeah. As the process has gone Absolutely. On too. I think you have to. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you don't, then, you know, you're not, you're just, I know some people who still are stuck in their ways in casting. It's just like, no, this is what they, this is how we did it. And this is what we do. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. But. It's just like your your grandmother or your mother that doesn't want to learn how to do a com- learn a computer or a smartphone. Yeah, you have to get with the times. Yeah, you do, or else it's going to pass you by. So um, for me, that's important, and I'm just also kind of a techie anyway. And I, I we probably got off subject of what it was. No, we not at about. all, not at all. We're we're gonna get off on all sorts of subjects. Okay. Today. <laughs> uh, so at this early time you worked on some pretty iconic films mm-hmm. i mean you you got a chance to be there and i'm assuming in the casting room and working with those things um, what kind of foundation did working with not just such esteemed casting directors mm-hmm. but the directors and the producers in mm-hmm. that time what sort of like insight were you able to get being a fly on the wall at that time i think what i and what i do miss kind of with uh, the process now because back then you had your producers and directors in the room with you. Mm-hmm. you yeah. Know, and um, you don't get that as much anymore? Not as much anymore. I think that's probably the most valuable lesson or uh, lessons I learned in that process because you meet them face to face instead of, you know, on a phone or, you know, a casting concept call or a kickoff call or whatever it is at the beginning of a project. But um, you would actually sit with them and you'd talk about um, the characters. And I'm sure, you know, it it does happen every now and then. Like I, I might have like a producer or director in the room, but because everything is being shot somewhere else, like on location in Chicago, Atlanta, you know, you're wherever, Toronto, wherever it, you don't have the time mm-hmm. with them, um, and so I miss that process. I miss a lot of that when they're in the room and they're actually talking to the actors and getting to know them and vibe with them. And I get it a lot with my brother because he's he comes from an old school. <laughs> I was going to ask, so, is he? Yeah, no, is he's he that very way? hands on, yeah. especially when it's um, a feature or if it's a new pilot. Um, he definitely wants to meet with the actors and get to know them and vibe with them because he's very, like, feeling based. You know, a lot of times if an actor has, like, a strong amount of credits, uh. he's, you know, he, or even if they don't have strong credits, it's just, he'll just talk to them and kind of vibe with them and just, you know, um, and then, like, you know what? Just, you got the job. I'm just like, wait, hold. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen him read yet. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but um <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's it's that's probably the biggest step that I missed the most and what I've learned the most from, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, for everyone out there who doesn't know that Leah Daniels Butler has a brother named Lee Daniels who is an incredible filmmaker and directed uh, the butler. Uh, directed the butler. <laughs> <laughs> Which we talked a little bit about on the drive over here. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, as I mentioned before we talked today, I'm kind of jealous of the fact that you've got a family member that you get to work with. I think that oh. that's really great. Like, I love my, my family. I grew up in a very tight family back mm-hmm. in Arkansas. And uh, just the fact that you guys get to work together is really cool to me. Uh, but I'm curious what kind of shorthand you two share and what sort of, like, shared... Uh, tastes and insights mm-hmm. that you guys share from growing up together and from from what I assume seems to be a, a pretty good relationship between the two of you. Yeah, you know, growing up, he, my brother was always super creative. He's always been, like, into the arts in some sort of way. I remember he was, like, he took tap dancing, and I thought, why did he get to take tap dancing? But I guess, again, my mother probably saw his creativity and didn't really want to stifle it Mm -hmm. at a young age. You know, she really wanted, she was really, really supportive um, of him. And he, um, even in his, you know, in his his younger years, uh, when he was in high school, 
um, he was getting teased a lot. And I remember she took him out of a, reg, you know, this, the high school that was in our neighborhood and, and put him in Radnor, um, which was mm. um, outside of, was in Radnor, PA, outside of Philadelphia. And again, just wanted to have him in a, a safe environment, obviously, so he couldn't get bullies, but also to just really tap into his creativity. But but that being said, he was just really, really... Um, it's almost like we knew he was probably going to do something like this, direct or be in the industry in some sort of way. Because I remember when we were younger, we used to have these plays in the basement. He, <laughs> he specifically, I remember the book, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And he took the book from the library and ripped the pages out. And it was... And at that time, the book wasn't written, and I don't know if if it's still this way, but Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was not like like a regular book. It was literally in play form. Oh. Like each character, it like so it was like I didn't he didn't have to write a script because the lines were like, you know, this person says this and this person says that and this, and it was just like okay, you're gonna be this person and you're gonna be that person and you're gonna be this person and now go. <laughs> and so we would literally rehearse and do this in my mother's basement and it was five of us I'm the youngest of five and um and then the neighbors because we you know we had the biggest it was so many of us so our house was like the, the house. hangout spot yeah uh-huh. <laughs> so all the kids on the block would just you know come to our plays and you know they would stay on our stoop and stuff so he was really um he he was always that creative he used to, he used to make me the best paper dolls I remember having really good paper dolls when we were younger. He would make the like outline the legs and make these little shoes. And this is the time when you know everybody was buying the paper dolls. But I had real ones with real clothes, and it was. And he made the flaps and everything. And it was just, he was just super creative at a very young age. Um, and we, and because of that, I'm the youngest. He's the oldest. Mm-hmm. We just were really, we were the probably I think the closest. Because I was young and he would have to go to school. He was the last one to go to school and I was a baby and he would, you know, make sure that I... Looking out for you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So so he's got that big brother Yeah, look definitely. Out thing. Yeah. And then when my father passed, he sort of became the man of the house. Yeah. And um, so it was really important for, you know, him to be protective of just, you know, not my sisters and my other brother, but my mom too, you know. So we just always understood each other. I understand his sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And so when we're in casting, I get it. You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't even have to (laughs) to say anything. I just Just know right away what he's thinking, the looks, every every nuance that he makes, I know exactly what he's, what he means by that without him having to say one word. That has got to make things, I feel like, a lot easier in it the does. casting process. It does. It does. It really does because he'll yeah. say, he'll go, he'll just say, hmm, 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 okay. <laughs> and that tells you everything you need yep. to know. <laughs> <laughs> How has y'all's relationship grown since you've started working together? Um, you know, the funny thing is, is that I was working at Warner Brothers for really, for a period, mm-hmm. and he was managing. And it wasn't until he did Monsters Ball where he yeah, really he started. Ma- I didn't realize he, he managed Wes Bentley. Oh, Wes Bentley. For a while. Another Arkansan. Forrest, Love yeah. Wes Bentley. Like he's, he's managed a, a, a fair lot, amount of yeah. careers. I think he very early on then um, in, he, he did, uh, what's his name? Um, Morgan Freeman, I mm-hmm. think, for a little while. He represented a lot of, like, a lot of good actors. Um, but it, at any rate... He, um, when I was at Warner Brothers, he was doing that. And when he produced Monsters Ball, I was working at Warner Brothers at the time. And he, <laughs> I remember he called me about Puffy being in Monsters Ball. He says, what do you, what do you know about Puffy? Like, who's Puffy? <laughs> and I remember Billy Hopkins, who was, um, who used to be his partner, uh, cause they have my, you know, they have, they used to be together and they raised my niece and my nephew mm-hmm. who are grown now. But, um, I remember Billy on the phone saying, oh, some rapper. And I'm like, Billy, he's not just some <laughs> rapper. He's like, at that time, was like, the rapper? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, 
So there was that, but once he got Monster's Ball off the ground and it became like, you know, the phenomenon that it was, um, that's when it was sort of the next step in his career. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think we worked together again. Well, we didn't really even work together because it was like when he did Monster's Ball, I, I didn't work on Monster's Ball. We he, we kind of just talked about different actors and ideas and things like that. But I didn't work. I wasn't the casting director on Monsters. Yeah. Billy Hopkins was, and um, after after Monsters Ball, it was Tennessee, and then that, and we worked on Tennessee, The Woodsman, and Shadow Boxer, and those movies all you know they were all sort of critically acclaimed. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until Precious that. It was like this big splash. Just explosion. Yeah. Yeah. And then after, obviously, Precious is when we did The Paperboy. Mm-hmm. And then after The Paperboy was The Butler. And we worked on several... Uh, I mean, like, in between The Paperboy... In between Precious and The Paperboy, we were going to do Selma. Mm. And we actually did cast the movie. Oh, y'all went through the whole mm -hmm. casting? Oh, yeah. We went through the process. We actually cast David huh. Oyelowo. Really? Which, yeah. <laughs> what? Yes. We That's We actually wild. cast David Oyelowo. And, How long um, was he? So you went to a full casting process oh, for yeah. Selma, and then it went... And oh, then huh. my brother didn't end up directing yeah. it. And then um, we went and did Paperboy, and then yeah. after Paperboy, we did The Butler. Um, but yeah, David Oyelowo was supposed to... Um, which is why David Oyelowo was in The Paperboy and okay. why he was in The Butler because, uh -huh. you know, he really wanted him to, he really wanted to work with him. Mm -hmm. So they built a really, really good relationship. And then David went, I guess, um, he worked with Ava DuVernay on another project and um, he really wanted to play Martin Luther King. So he was able to okay. bring... Ava and Plan B together so they could make this movie and um and they did a wonderful job too so yeah um but I think he was really who else was there anybody else in the movie that we were gonna cast I feel like there might have been two or three people that we actually they were just were, so right for the role yeah, that everybody's that gonna they cast ended them up, as that. yeah I think there were like two or three people that we were really really heavily considering hmm. um, for parts in the pro project that actually still made it in the project yeah so yeah <laughs> so real quick I actually want to step back in time a little bit mm -hmm. um, I've watched any interview that you've done online there are a few out there we'll link to all of them in the uh, show notes. In one of the interviews, you say that your first credit is mm -hmm. CB4. Yes. CB4 is rad. <laughs> uh, if you guys don't know it, uh, it's directed by Tamara Davis, mm -hmm. who directed a ton of great music videos, um, written by and starring Chris Rock. Mm -hmm. And it's got Alan Payne, Deezer D, <laughs> Phil Hartman, Charlie Murphy. Oh, my God. It is... Candy Alexander. Candy Alexander. There's so many it really wonderful in actors movie. in that movie. And yeah. it, it it just reminds me of that time. There's mm -hmm. there's something about the quality of that movie that really nails that day and age. Mm -hmm. um, the well, cast, first it was shot on film. That they helps. don't do that anymore. No, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, the casting director of note on that is Kim Harden, and you worked yes. with Kim on that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a rapumentary covering the rise <laughs> to fame of this like gangster rap group uh, called CB4, Cell Block 4. Um, <laughs> what do you remember from this first project of yours? What do I remember? I remember us being over the, the, the production office was over in Culver City. I remember I used to have this little beat up, bright yellow Honda CVCC. Didn't even the Civics weren't even out yet, or they were, but I didn't. I couldn't afford one. I think I paid eight hundred and fifty dollars for the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that car got me around too. <laughs> um, but I used to have to travel from Silver Lake to Culver City every day in that car because I was still staying with my brother at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember. The production office got broken into and all the computers got stolen. Oh, no. <laughs> like, we weren't there for, like, maybe two weeks. I don't even think we were there that long. Everything got stolen. Uh -huh. 
And so they had to get all new equipment, and then they put in a security system and all of that. I, I, I'm assuming that the production office space was really, really cheap where we were at because, like, we had the whole parking lot, and it was like an old building, and mm -hmm. so yeah. So that's probably the most memorable thing. But um, there were so many memorable things because uh, Nelson George was also a producer. Him and Chris Rock produced it together. And Nelson George, if you don't know who he is, is um, I would how would I, I mean he's obviously a scholar. Uh, he is an author, very prominent in New York, and I, I'm not sure how him and Chris Rock got together, but maybe because he was doing a lot of articles about hip hop music at that time, mm -hmm. like he was, you know, he was one of. Um, one of many writers, or uh, I'm not sure what you would call them, but um, but they would just they would uh, crit not critique, but just talk about hip hop during that time. Yeah, and um, but he was very well known, and I think he him and Chris wrote CB4 together. Okay. I think so. I'm not 100% because it's been so long ago. Yeah. And I didn't really do my research before we had this interview. <laughs> so I'm, you know, take everything that I'm saying with a grain of salt <laughs> if, it, if it's more than like, you know, five years ago. Um, but anyway, the one audition scene <laughs> was with Charlie Murphy and Candy Alexander. And I, did you see the movie? Have yeah, you seen it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you know the part where she's in the bedroom and. He comes in and uh -huh. he's like, they're about to get it on. Yeah. And she has this leopard bodysuit on and she's doing these back flips and she's doing all this stuff. And she did that in the audition. Was and, that on the page? Um, it, Not all of that, no. That's, that's the thing. <laughs> she came in and she did all of that in the audition and everybody just hollered. Oh, that's so good. Like, we're like, what? Are you kidding me? Like it was in it was uh. bananas. And um obviously she got the part and it was a chemistry read between her and Charlie Murphy. Mm -hmm. And they were both in the room together. And so and that's the other thing that I kind of miss about that process because you used to bring the actors in and they would just like play out the whole excuse me, play out the whole movie in front of you. And you would see it and you're just like, "Oh my god, this I this is this is what it's going to look like on screen." And um that's probably one of another memorable moment aside from us getting robbed. <laughs> <laughs> so another one from your early career <laughs> is the Wayans brothers. Yes. Uh, you were, uh, and we haven't really talked too much about this, but early career, you ended up as an executive mm -hmm. for a while at Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, after working with Jackie and Kimberly, you you landed an assistant job with Leslie Litt, yes. who was the senior VP of casting yes, at she, Warner. Yes. And, it, I mean, she's she's responsible for some really incredible television. If, Ridiculous. And, and, and I mentioned a lot of these names on the show. A lot of people don't know who casting directors are, which yeah. is kind of frustrating. But yeah. Leslie Litt did Friends mm -hmm. and, and uh, Suddenly Susan. She and did. Just so much, so she did much a of that time. of television, um, but Leslie was an executive before she went independent and before she okay. went over at Warner Brothers. I'm not sure where she went, where she was before she uh, landed at Warner Brothers. Um, but we were all under the tenure of Barbara Miller. Okay, and Barbara Miller was iconic in the industry. She cast. I don't know if you guys remember this movie, and you may not, because this is an old black movie called Sparkle. I don't know Sparkle. It is literally like a staple in the black community. It is? Okay. <laughs> yeah, they redid it. Okay. And it was done by Mara Braca Kill and her husband, Salim Akil. And I think Salim directed it. Okay. And That was the remake? That was the remake. Okay. The original, if you look that up... Um, Barbara Miller, a little old Jewish white woman, cast it, and she did a phenomenal job. Yeah, and that was probably that was one of the first movies I really remember watching, and like, oh my god, this cast is amazing. That what is it was, about? It it was because it's it's basically about three young black girls, sort of like um, 
a spin off, not not a spin, but like a t- different take of like a Dream Girls. Okay. Where you have these three young black girls from New York, Harlem, and they could sing. They sang in the church choir, and the lead singer became was beautiful, and she was like the girl in town, and it was set in the '60s, and she meets this guy and she's always wanted to be the big time and he like turns out on drugs and all kinds of things and um she ends up dying and her younger but her younger sister is responsible for her boyfriend being brought down and, and she ODs it's just it's just probably one of the most <sighs> compelling stories that I saw as like a young person and and again when I found out that Barbara Miller mm-hmm. passed it, I, I had a newfound respect for her. I was just like, I think I was looking, I think I found out by accident too. It was just like we were in the office one day and somebody had made me these these like little figurines and they were like, they asked me what my favorite movie was and I said Sparkle. And they made me these figurines of these three black girls singing. And when I was just like, oh my God, I love Sparkle. And I was like looking it up and I was like looking at who was cast. And... I said, Barbara Miller cast it? I went down the hallway and was like, oh, my God, Barbara, I had no idea. She was like, what? What? Because <laughs> she would sit behind her desk smoking her cigarettes. We weren't supposed to be smoking in the building. And she's like, what? What is it? Come in. And I said, you cast Sparkle. And she's like, oh, yes. These diamonds, yes. Yes, dear, yes. That was so long ago. And she couldn't believe, like, that I knew words, I knew, like, Mm. literally routines, everything. I was just like, you don't even understand. And I thought that I was supposed to, like, for me, that was a sign that I'm supposed to be casting the remake. I didn't end up casting it. (laughs) But um, but, uh, I met on it, which was great. You did? (laughs) I did meet on it. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. When did the original come out? The original may have come out in, what, seven? Seventy-six. Yeah, seventy-six. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was like around the time that Cooley High came out. Okay. Yeah. Um, they were, you know, those were the movies that were coming out like right after Black Exploitation. It was sure. these sort of dramatic like movies, but it was that next stage yeah, after that next the stage black after exploitation. the Black Exploitation. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So those were the kinds of movies that you grew up really, on. Yeah. Yeah. That I actually like watched and it was those movies were important for me because I think those when I think about that and kung fu movies yeah because <laughs> I used to watch kung fu movies a lot yeah but those are the movies that I kind of grew up on yeah well and I I'm, I'm curious about that part of your life and that part of because I think that's a really developmental mm-hmm. stage for people like the movies that you grow up on the tv shows mm-hmm. that you grow up on those things I think really affect you yeah. Uh, especially if you end up in the industry in general. Like, there, there is something about the things that I grew up watching that certainly define the things that I watch or do or write or yeah. want to be a part of now. 100%. Sure. And I also make it required watching for the assistance. You that, do? Oh, yes. I always... Gregory had a slew of things. I said, you never saw Sparkle? You never... Did you see An Imitation of Life? Did you see um, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane? Did you see... <laughs> You had to get him on the same page as you were. 100%. That is... 100%. That's great. You have to... Because you... you, For me, anyway, that's what cinema really was. You mm-hmm. know, when I think about the programming that I watched, you know, Good Times and um, The Bunkers and The Waltons and um, what was that other one where they were on the farm a uh, little house, little house on the prairie, uh-huh. yeah, um, and just like th- those were the programs that I grew up watching. So it's really important that Lucy and 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 uh, I can't think of anything. Else. You know what I mean? It's all like I'm sure it'll all come back to me. In a, oh, an hour from now, you're gonna have all. Yeah, these I'll, <laughs> I'll be thinking about it all. Um, the the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh huh. Um, you know what I mean? Those were the staple programs that you watched. And so th- when I compare that to a lot of the stuff that's, you know, that we have today, it's, it's definitely different. Times have changed. But, um, when I think about, oh my God, I was watching reruns of Sanford and Son. It still holds up. Listen, not only does it, still, they 
were saying a lot of shit that they that they're, that should be said what? right now and that's still being said right now. Yeah. Or that you will get in trouble for saying right oh, now. Oh, sure. Oh yeah. my god. I was oh, looking yeah. at I said that they just say the N word oh, yeah. on I was watching all of the family the other day and it's the same Listen, shit. I'm like what? You could get away with that? Isn't that crazy? It and is. now everything is like, oh yeah. no, we can't say that. We can't yeah. do this. We can't say that. And it's just it's 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 like I understand it, but at the same time, it's like it was it you you it's almost like you can't really be real. You yeah. can be real. Everybody wants to say this is real, but everybody has these trigger points on, you know, what is politically correct or what you shouldn't say or what you can't. You know what I mean? And it's like, what just happened to just saying shit? <laughs> Sure. You know, yeah, that, build up a little bit of a tough skin, and you, you know, if you, the, it's the analogy I use all the time is I have a buddy who is always con- he's constantly putting that that hand sanitizer on, mm-hmm. and he's sick all the time. It's because he's because getting all he's, the good germs away. Exactly, <laughs> it's the same. So I think it's the it, and I use that analogy for, for really this good. kind of situation is we we have sanitized everything, mm-hmm. and when everything's completely sanitary, that littlest thing. Is going to throw somebody off, and that's that's the world that we're in right now. And I think it's it's kind of frustrating. I like that analogy. I'm probably yeah. going to steal it. <laughs> Feel free to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about a little bit more about your work here. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked uh, about a couple shows, a couple. Uh, let's start with Precious, mm-hmm. um, directed by Lee Daniels, mm-hmm. based on the novel by Sapphire. The movie won yeah. two Oscars. Um, best Adapted Screenplay, and Monique won for Best Supporting Role. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also introduced us to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say your name right, I swear to God, Gabare Sidibe? Sidibe. Sidibe. Yes. Sidibe. Good Gabare job. Sidibe. Um, she's, <laughs> I just call her Gabby. Gabby. <laughs> she's lovely. Um, she lovely. She's in, in, out of nowhere mm-hmm. with Precious. Uh, I want to talk about casting Precious's character. Mm-hmm. Um, because you have, you have to find an overweight, abused, illiterate teen who's pregnant with her second kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where and how do you start this process? And how did you finally land on Miss Gabby? Um, well, we did a search. Billy covered New York and I covered LA. And Billy Hopkins, that is. Mm -hmm. And who's also cast some amazing movies and projects. Um, we worked together on all of my brother's projects, uh, which is great because obviously we know him very well. Mm-hmm. And um, we started off just seeing, I guess, the regular you know, actresses in Hollywood where you put out a breakdown and you describe the character. And as the actors are coming in, no one is fitting the description, the physicality. Uh, and we saw that very clearly early on, that no one was fitting the physicality of who this uh, character was. When you describe her as overweight, teen, illiterate, like they're, all the actors that are coming in are polished. Mm-hmm. I don't think at the time it was, Hollywood wasn't as open to women that weren't a size. For sure. Four, six. Yeah. So you didn't have we didn't have a lot to choose from. The only other way to find that character was to have an open call mm-hmm. and to really dig deep into a real place to find someone that fit that description. And that's what it and that's really how it all happened. It wasn't she didn't come in in a regular audition. She was found in an open call in New York. Okay. And um and I want to say she was probably one of the last people or the last group because at that time, you know, open calls were a lot different than <laughs> they are now. You uh-huh. can just put out a blurb on the internet and hashtag this and <laughs> upload it to, to Box and you get to see it, uh-huh. you know. But now, but then you had to put things out like in the paper and on the radio and you literally had to get it out that way. And then we're going to be here on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., not Saturday Full and on Sunday. Full-on cattle call. Full-on cattle call, and the yeah. lines are around the corner. Uh-huh. And you know how they are in New York oh, anyway. Yeah. So they'll do that for just a regular audition, <laughs> uh-huh. let alone a movie with Lee Daniels in. You know, So mm-hmm. that's basically the process. And she was one of the last, and, and, and 
the audition sides, um, when you're doing an open call, you don't generally give the entire script or the sides. You just hear something like they come in, they do a little blurb, they get a call back or not. They get a call back. You are them. you the flavor or are you not? Yeah, like yeah. You, because with an open call, you get you see so many people. You and gotta, it's a you lot. gotta be efficient. Yeah, and you mm. and you know, and everybody they don't care. Like even though it says overweight, da 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 da. Everybody's coming in. You they don't. Get, they you're look. gonna get the dude with the abs. You're gonna get the. <laughs> you get it all, and you can't not see him. Sure. So you see everybody, and um, she's part of the last group, and. Billy gave her the callback for the following day, and this callback was with Lee. And they sat and they talked. She did the lines. And because, you know, if you know Gabby, she's always very, you know, she's very, very um, confident. Always, you know, she's an upbeat. And so he constantly had to really have her, like, come from a place of, you know, uncertainty. Like, you, you can't have that publicly... Per- like, you have to be in a sunken place, sort of, um, because she wasn't... Even in the audition? Even in the audition. He had to have her... You know, that was part of hmm. her audition. I need you to come to... So his feedback in audition mm-hmm. was to... Yes. ...revoke some of the confidence. Yes, and um And she then did she it. did it. And he told her on the spot, you got the job. On the spot in in the like, callback. You got the job. Right. <laughs> That's cool. And and obviously the rest is is history. Yeah. You know, like she and I think she really opened up the doors for for women who were not your typical Hollywood um type girls. Do you yeah, know what she I did. mean? Like yeah. she really opened that door because now, oh, you mean because I think most people thought, oh, that was a role, that was a type, she'll probably never work again. But she no, didn't. No, not at all. She like literally okay, next movie, next uh-huh. movie, next television show, next and it became a thing. What did cuz she has no credits before that None. at all. Mm-mm. Had she been doing theater? Had she You know, you know, I, it's so funny because I hear some talented. things. I hear some things that maybe she might have had a little experience, but I don't think, as far as I know, mm-hmm. she had no acting experience. This was her okay. very first audition <sighs> and her first acting job, as far as I know. I know that her, I think her mom was a was a performer. Uh, her mom might have did some singing or something like that. But I don't. But I, as far as I know, for her, I don't think she had any acting experience. None. That's yeah. It's a Cinderella story. That's is. what I like to call Cinderella stories. I was literally I wrote down <laughs> you've spoken about Cinderella stories yeah. often. Um mm-hmm. and and how few and far between those moments actually are. Mm-hmm. But it seems like with you, mm-hmm. they're not as few and far between. There are a lot you've had a fair bit of I'm instances of, of finding yeah. Cinderella. Yeah, I you know, it's it's yes. Um and but I feel like it it really depends on who I'm working with in terms of a, like a director. Like my brother is ve- always, 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 the types of projects that he casts, it's always coming from a place of realness. Mm-hmm. So And he does that extremely yeah, well. So he always wants an actor who feels authentic. Mm-hmm. And in doing that, a lot of times, you can't just cast like you would normally. Mm-hmm. I can't cast like out of the, off of... Um, breakdown services or through agencies a lot of times it has to be i have to go a little deeper than that and that is um sometimes it, you know it's it's i don't know what they call it i don't call it street casting but i have literally picked some people up off the street on the way to set because yeah. my brother didn't necessarily like a uh <laughs> we were doing what was, we were doing the butler and it was the black power it was a black panther scene and he didn't like any of the extras in New Orleans. I remember he didn't like any of the extras. And he was just like, "These, uh, I need some real people. I, I don't care how you get just them. Just not get selling them. as real Black Panther. It wasn't. It wasn't, no. Huh. And it was one of the, it was the scene. that I don't know if they cut it. No, I think it is in there. It's the scene where they're in the room and they're recruiting. And they're talking about 
what the Black Panthers do, you know, um, providing after school programs and meals for kids and, you know, the the good things is you don't really hear that much yeah. about the Black Panther group, but that's what the scene was. And I had called him on, I was on my way to set and I called him and he was just like, I, listen, they need to figure this out. <laughs> I'm driving and I'm on at a stop sign and I see this woman on a bus stop and I look at her and I was like, I think my brother might like your look. I rolled down the window and I said, "Hey, you want to be in a movie?" And she <laughs> and she said, "Yes." And I said, "Well, get in the car." Now listen, this woman don't know me. I don't know her. The most trusting people in New Orleans. She got in that car and, and she's in the Butler. She that's, is in the Butler. That is a trip. We go <laughs> drive to the set. We get out the car. I take her over to the set, and my brother does this thing in between takes when they're setting up. He's playing his music, and the music, and everybody's like vibing, mm -hmm. and and he's playing. I forget what he's playing. All I know is that she comes, like I go to introduce her to him, and he's in the tent. And he was like, "Hey!" and she just started dancing. He was like, "Take off that thing on your head, honey." She took that wig off, and it had a stocking cap on. He was like, "Get her to set right now. Get her to wardrobe." Awesome. And she and had a line in the movie. She had a line in the movie. Bumped her up. She That's was a hilarious. she came an extra and an actress all in the same day. <laughs> 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 From the bus stop. From the bus stop. Oh, that's hilarious. And so, and I know I got off track. That's but full I on say, Cinderella story. There. But I say that to say it's always a. It comes from a place a place of authenticity. He yeah. has to have that, and and so and he likes working with actors that have like a realness about them. Um, and then there's sometimes where it doesn't necessarily work, um, where you have to have actors that are trained and understand the craft. Yeah. But um, but for the most part, he's been really really. Um, fortunate and lucky with helping to launch these careers of these completely unknowns with no acting experience yeah. at all, and and they're they've gone on to um, have like magnificent careers. Well, I want to fast forward now to a show that you're currently doing, mm -hmm. Empire. Mm -hmm. um, a really, really incredible show. It's been the top of its time slot since it started, mm -hmm. I think, um, it, uh, the, the, it was directed by your brother, the first episode, mm -hmm. um, created by Lee and by Danny Strong, mm -hmm. uh, starring Terrence Howard, Yaz, uh, a.k.a. Brashear Y. Gray, Jesse Smollett, uh, Trey Byers? Right, mm -hmm. Byers. Byers, and Taraji P. Henson. Yep. Taraji is... Force, <laughs> holy shit! Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll get into that in a moment. But talking about the realness, mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk a little bit about Yaz. Mm -hmm. um, Yaz is super natural on this show. Yeah. Um, even coming out of not really having done the acting thing, uh, he's another Arkansas fella. So mm -hmm. shout out there. Uh, I'm curious how much of that natural demeanor was him coming in and how much of that is a testament to the direction and the writing um, as well as the other actors? Because it seems like in the first episode, you've got him with Terrence. And mm -hmm. Terrence is a seasoned actor, an incredible actor, who takes him under his wing almost. Mm -hmm. But it is like the father and son relationship, so it works extremely well. That's kind of like how it was in the audition. It was. Oh, 100%. Okay, so... <laughs> When we were casting for Empire, originally, the original cast was not supposed to be Terrence Howard. It was supposed, well, we were in negotiations with Wesley Snipes. Huh. Um, and Wesley, we wanted obviously someone that was dynamic and someone that could, was believable. And people are like, oh, I can't imagine Wesley being, I could totally, like at that time, I mean, when you think about, um, the movies that he did, New Jack City, and it's like he would have been a different kind of Lucius. A, it would have been a much different Lucius, it would have for been sure. A much different Lucius, but still a powerful, a powerful right. And yeah. then, but that would have changed the dynamic of the family as well. Yes, it would. The have. entire family would have because we had we had brown skin and light skin uh -huh. lions. <laughs> <laughs> Because we was going to have to, you know, darken them babies up a little bit. 
if it was Wesley Snipes. <laughs> um, but for whatever reason, I think it didn't work out. You know, my um, it was my brother's introduction to television, and it was Wesley's introduction to television. Neither one of them had done huh. television, and I think they were both a little like gun shy. You know, like. They were understandably oh, yeah. so. Yeah, and so the deal didn't happen, and they made the offer to Terrence, and because Terrence and Lee already had a um, previous relationship from working on the Butler. Yeah, they had just worked together, and Terrence, I will say, you know, it was so funny because he didn't. My brother wasn't going to cast him in the Butler either, and he Terrence flew down to New Orleans when we were casting the Paperboy. We we're working on the Paperboy, and it's like. No, you want. I want to meet you face to face because you want to see who I am. And once you meet me, you want to understand. You want me in on your team. You want me uh. in your. And they built that relationship, and he be, he became a cast member in The Butler, and then from there they have that. And now he is Lucius Lyon. Yeah. And Taraji actually had to audition. Did she really? She did. I mean, her career has been. It's this weird thing that she's not as known, I think, as she should be. You know, here's the thing. She, I think everybody knew that it was going to be Taraji yeah. from the beginning. I was going to ask about that. I think we all knew that it yeah. was going to be her. But what happened was, um, obviously, when in, when you're in the audition process, you, you, you have to see people. Mm-hmm. You can't not audition actors for a lead show um, unless they already come attached, like, in the case that Terrence did, and, and and honestly, the 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 project itself was really not about a family, uh, a husband and a wife, and it was about this man who was this sort of god in the music industry and what he you know his background where he came from and his sons fighting for that position. Yeah. But when you bring Taraji into the fold. It changed the dynamic of the show. For sure. And then it became, oh, no, it's the Lions. It's not about this, because it wasn't a male lead show. Mm-hmm. But originally, it was a male lead show. Okay. That's how it was presented. And then it changed, obviously, because when you see her on camera and them two together, it's like literally hustle and flow all over again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because they have this dynamic chemistry. But we did audition actors. Um, she didn't audition like when I say like a traditional audition, come in, sign in, and you know, she was a screen test and she was in a vacuum by herself. Yeah. It wasn't like she had a she could sit out in the, yeah, in no, the no, no, room no. with a bunch like of other people. Yeah. It was a screen test. So it wasn't really like an audition, a regular audition, like regular actors' auditions. Uh-huh. <laughs> but she still had to read. It for was it. more like a you have you know, you got the job if you really come in and do this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really. Um, and that's really what happened. But on the same day that she came in, Yaz had uh, was rescheduled because he was supposed to screen test the day before he missed his flight. Ah. Uh. And when he came in the next day, he came in on Terrence and Taraji. Tira- Tira- Terrence was reading with Taraji for her screen cool. test. And How standard is that? Um... Well, they do that a lot yeah. for chemistry. Okay. You know, sometimes. Yeah. Depends. If they're both auditioning, um, or if one person's auditioning, they may bring the other person in just to read with them so they can see the chemistry. Sure. Obviously, we know they have chemistry from the movies that they've done together. But, um, yes, comes in, <laughs> missed his flight the day before, piggybacking on Taraji's audition. Terrence happened to be there. The scene was with the father, and the brother, so they brought Jussie back mm-hmm. to read with him, and Terrence said, "I'll read with him." Cool. And so he, his second audition ever. You're sitting there reading with Terrence. With Harold, Terrence Howard, <laughs> in the world, the second audition ever. I feel like that's gotta <laughs> help. Oh yeah, because you're I mean, you're in you're in when you because when you're working as an actor mm-hmm. when you're working with another actor who's really good. It just you can just let you. go. You don't. You don't have to. Like, yeah, you don't have to do anything. You don't. And that's what Terrence said to him. It was uh, so when, when we were watching it, he was like, "I think the line was, um, you know, did you do this?" He was like, "Look at me when I'm talking to you," because Yaz, as an un- inexperienced performer, didn't know what to do. He doesn't know stage direction. Yeah. He doesn't know any of that. And so when Terrence says, "Look at me when I'm talking to you." His natural instinct was to look up because this is a grown man talking to me, not 
I'm acting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is my father right now talking to me. So he his, automatically his posture changed, and now you see it. You literally see lightning in a bottle. Uh huh. And it's like, and my hairs are actually standing up on the back of my neck now that I'm thinking about it. Like, because you see it, you saw it play out. And I was like, oh, no, he's going to get this job. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He's going to get this job. And he got that job. Yeah. To have your call, your, your like first, because he, he's a rapper. He, Mm -hmm. he hadn't done any acting really before that. He he hadn't Maybe done some any music acting. Videos? He he I think he I don't think he did any music. He had a couple uh, of performances because yeah. he was being a rapper on YouTube. Yeah, like that were shot by on a phone camera. Mm-hmm. He hadn't done anything, and um, his first audition, we saw it, and I was like, it's something raw about this kid. But he's had these moments that just kept coming out that certain things you just can't teach actors. Yeah, you have to have that instinctually and that's what he had instinctually and and it was like okay if he gets some training mm-hmm. along with his instincts he's out of here yeah and um that's and you give much... him give him a couple years on a tv show i think he'll get it oh yeah, yeah. for and sure he, and, and he and he now he's, he's, he's made kept up extremely 100 well, for sure mm-hmm. and so it's it's i mean when i see things like that happening to actors that I've had a hand in helping. It is very rewarding. It's got to feel good. It does. Yeah. It does. It yeah. feels, it's very rewarding. Um, musical performances and and believability in that space is huge mm-hmm. with Empire. Um, and I've heard you talk a couple times about the casting the boys, uh, and and how difficult it was to find somebody who can sing and dance mm-hmm. and act mm-hmm. and you know, act on the level that Terrence Howard and Taraji mm-hmm. P. Henson are going to be acting. <laughs> like, that's a, you're asking a lot yes. in that situation. Um, how much does that continue to be a difficulty as the show progresses? Or have you guys found it easier to find the right people now that the show has found that success and found the its, its pacing? Well, if you mean like newer actors that are coming onto the show yeah. that are that we need to sing and and do whatever. It's funny because when we were doing it, it was really really hard. Mm-hmm. It was really hard. We we even I think tapped into um the the talent scout for American Idol. Like we had yeah, we were we had obviously we had searches all over the country. Um but we were even tapping into Fox's sort of repertoire of the who sang or who did something on that show that could be right for this. Yeah. Um, so it was a lot of people putting an input to try to find the right group of, you know, kids or the two kids that could actually sing. And um, again, it wasn't super easy to find that. But as the season went on, it was like everybody that had a little bit of talent in terms of singing really started honing in on that. Because I always tell people, especially when I was casting the first and second season, if you can do anything outside of acting, if you have, if you maybe you took singing lessons when you were a kid, maybe you took dancing lessons, do it all. Yeah. Because now shows are different. Shows are, it's not like it's a, um, a musical in the sense of, you know, singing in the rain. Yeah. But it's still a but musical. It's a musical, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And so you have to be able to bring all of that. Mm-hmm. And so I think what 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 has happened as a result of that is that people are really, really like not just, oh, I'm not just gonna be this. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do all three of it really, really well. And so it's been easier as the seasons progress now uh-huh. because people already know, um, oh, I can sing. Or, you know, it's like I, I, there's so much more talent out there now in terms of singing and acting and dancing than it ever was when we first started casting that pilot. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. And I, th- I think that shows like this allow for that. Oh, yeah. Because there, we had Glee there for a while. Mm-hmm. That there was a lot of singing, dancing, acting. And... And the the idea of musical kind of faded away yeah. out of the American zeitgeist for a while. Um, and it pops up every now and again. And I think what Empire has done with that format mm-hmm. is really, really not just clever, but really beautifully done. 
Yes. Um, from the first episode on of, of you know, Yaz in the booth, mm-hmm. you've got Chris Red there. I didn't, uh, I noticed Chris <laughs> Red. I love Chris Red. I think he's one of the funniest <laughs> people on the planet. Um, I noticed him. I rewatched the pilot last night. Um, but just, just in the, even in the pilot, the, the moments that you have of singing uh, when Yaz comes down the stairs. Oh, yeah. In the very, like... It just it takes off in a different way than other musicals do. Yeah, you knew you were watching something yes. special when that when that when that scene came when that scene came on. Yeah, like you knew you were like, oh wow, this is going to be a good show. And then every every episode after that just was even more polarizing because it. And I think that people could relate to the struggle. And yeah. that's what it was. It's like because yeah, there's a lot of have, different struggles mm-hmm. in the show. Yeah, people could relate to the struggle, and mm-hmm. that's what I think television was missing at the time. Yeah, you know, it wasn't. You know, they had good shows on TV, but they did not have anything that these people, that black people, really could really, really relate to. Yeah, because there are more cookies, cookie lions, than there were Olivia Pope's. Do you know sure. what I mean? People I do. understood yeah. that, especially in, in my community, mm-hmm. because no matter if you lived in Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York, wherever you live, there's a hood in every city. Mm-hmm. There's a cookie lion. In every, that's, I think that's why so many lawsuits came out, because everybody's like, that's my story. No, bitch, <laughs> you can't it's take my that story too. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's everybody's story. Yeah. Because a hood, it's every hood USA. Yeah. Well, and I think the conversation that we're having in in the world right now about diversity and about Mm -hmm. uh, diversity in storytelling and diversity in representation, Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to see those sort of things. And, and, And then when you do start to see them creep in, just exactly what you said, everybody's like, oh, that's my story. Yeah. I have that story. it's real. And there's... There's that share, and then I get to see that because I grew up on a farm in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. I don't know that story. I like we didn't. I went to a, the city for the first time when I was 17. Yeah. Like, uh, but listen, middle you, of nowhere. I got my story you, for sure. You're no different because there are people that grew up here in LA that never crossed Wilshire. Oh, for sure. I and I <laughs> I, I think that's important yeah. to to point out too. But mm-hmm. it, but it's the idea that if I can tell my story then you guys can know, the people who haven't crossed Wilshire can know what it's like to grow up on a cattle farm and have your nearest neighbor be a mile away mm-hmm. and to literally just spend your time doing nothing but watching grass right. grow. And then when I watch something like Empire or I can see a whole different right. world. Right, and I think right. that that's, it's, it's, it's great that we're seeing diversity so that people can see themselves. But I think what's even better is that there's diversity happening where we can see others. Yeah. Uh, and I say that specifically me as a white guy saying mm-hmm. <laughs> to see other people because, I mean, the, the Wayans was one of my introductions to black culture. Wow. Because I did, we just didn't have right. anything. We, there was nothing close to It was my family. That's... All around me. That's you know? crazy when you think about the Wayans and... And 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 uh, what was the other one? Um, Family Matters mm-hmm. was probably one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, so I I think it's great that these stories are being told and that people are now finding themselves showing up mm-hmm. in things. Yes, and that's wonderful. Yes, um, I'm getting the wrap, wrap it, it up, up <laughs> finger here. I've got so many more questions for you. Um, as I generally do with these things, we didn't even talk about Brian Banks, which uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll say a brief bit about. Uh, it's a movie that's out right now, or is it out right comes now? Out Coming in, out, I think in April. In, I yeah. think sometime April. Um, because you did the festival circuit and mm-hmm. stuff with it. It did really well on festival. Yeah, and it, now we have a, a formal release date. You do. Yes. Great. Uh, we'll, April we'll, the something another, but I know it's in April. We'll put out a link to that. Mm-hmm. Um, it stars Aldous Hodge as the yes. titular character of Brian Banks. I love Aldous Hodge. He is another really really incredible actor. For him. Um, directed by Tom Shadyac, which yes. is. What? <laughs> I know, right? He's always done so much comedy. He, he has. is probably one of the most amazing, just genuine people yeah. that I've ever met. Like having him okay. in the room, he, it was just, and watching him work and knowing that he's worked with the likes of Eddie Murphy and all those insane comedians, like, yeah. and, and in his. I mean, the Jim Carrey stuff, like Jim Carrey when he was at his 
peak. Peak. Yes. It was he, because of Tom Shady. And so it was just like, it was amazing to work with him. Um, and especially to have this experience with him. And I think his very first dramatic piece. Yeah. Um, it was just a great experience all around. And he loved Aldous from the very first moment Aldous came in the room. Mm -hmm. And um, he and, uh, and there's Greg Kinnear and there's Morgan Freeman. Yeah. Is in it, so we have a really, really nice cast. It's it looks really, great. Really the nice trailer, cast. the mm -hmm. trailer is incredible. There's a clip that I found online that we'll share as well. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know the story, it's about the, an all-American football player who, in 2002, mm -hmm. was uh, accused of raping a woman while in college. No, high school. High school. He was yes, what, 16, 17, 17? 16, 16 years 16 old. 16 years old. Falsely accused, yeah. He was in prison for six years, uh, had another five years of really strict parole, mm -hmm. and then in 2012, his accuser confessed that she had just completely fabricated the story. He actually got her to confess. He did? Uh, yes. He got her to confess. I don't want to give too much of the story away, although you can also see this on YouTube if you uh -huh. really just Google it. He, um, he had just got out and was on his parole and she dinged him on Facebook and basically said, let's hang out. I know what happened in the past. You know, it's the past. Now we should move on. And he's like, wait, he, what, what? And so he was the one that set up the surveillance. He got someone to tape her basically saying that it was all, you know, it was all a lie that her mother really put her up to it. But the crazy thing is that they didn't even do a little bit of investigation. No. That's the sad part. Because what she accused him of and where she accused him of doing it, if they had have just did a little tiny bit of research, they would have realized there's no way. Uh. Because she said that it happened at a certain part of the school. So that mean, And he was supposed to have drug her from one place to another. So all it's in the summertime in Long Beach. All the classroom doors are open and nobody saw this man dragging this girl down the hall and doing what he said that she did to her. Mm -hmm. how, how does that happen? And once it, you know, I think they might have fooled around, like they might have kissed or whatever, but he just was like, this is not right. Mm -hmm. He backed off. And I think one of the TAs saw, I saw what y'all were doing. Mm. And she was like, we wasn't doing nothing. I saw you and you fast and this, that, and the other thing. So she went and told her mother because she was scared. And her mother said, he uh. raped you. And then that's... I mean, it's it, it looks like an incredible movie. It's going to be so um, good. So that we'll we'll put up the details to that yes, when that's yes, going to yes. come out. Oh. Are there any any projects that you want to talk about, and where can people find and follow you on the internet? On social media, yeah. Um, on Twitter, my social media is at L Daniels Butler. Same on Facebook at L Daniels Butler, and on uh, Instagram it's at LDB Casting. Okay. Yes. And any projects you want to hype up? Any? Um, what's coming up outside of Brian Banks? I feel like, well, I'm working on, I'm about to be doing a new pilot. Um, my brother and Whitney Cummings are doing a half hour for Amazon. Awesome. Um, I love Good Whitney People. Cummings. Yes. He's she's, a, she's hilarious. She's so good. The script good. is so funny. Yeah. It's going it, to... Good. It, it, listen, it's kind of like what we were talking about, how the sanitizer yeah. is taking it off, and we'll probably like... Good. Every, yeah. It is. Good. It really... <laughs> and I think we're going to have to lean on comedians to do that. Oh, 100%. I really do. And I, I like Whitney and the whole gang of people that are around her, I think are incredible yeah so, really that's excited exciting about that. so we're about to start that cool and then um uh, my brother is going to be doing the billy holiday story terms of endearment so there's a lot of projects that are coming up so i'm really excited thank you thank you for your time really thank appreciate you for it. having me i appreciate Leah it daniels butler everybody hey <laughs> i really hope that you've enjoyed this episode I could have talked with Leah for hours. Do not forget to like, comment, subscribe, love, heart, thumbs up, and share this episode. I promise we won't spend all those likes in one place. A million thanks to our producer, Maria Perry. Placing Faces is powered by Collaborator.com, a media production service connecting media professionals to companies, brands, and agencies, allowing you to scale your production based on your needs. We would also like to thank the Casting Society of America. They are a hub of information about this branch of the film industry. To learn more about the society and what it takes to become a casting director, you can visit castingsociety.com. 
If you are a casting director and want to be part of the program, please reach out at contact at placingfaces.com. If you're a listener and have some questions for casting directors, reach out at contact at placingfaces.com. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, be well.